You lived eight years in Africa. Yep. Tell me about this. Like you said, it was a small village. Like what's the story there? My tribe is from a part of Nigeria called Benin. My family's one of like the founding families out there or something like that, equivalent to like being some type of royalty. And they have this tradition where like you send your firstborn kids or your sons to live with the chief of the tribe for a few years. And it was a very traumatizing experience. Dude, just put AI on it and it'll sell. Like, it's just whatever. <laughs> I There's can't a lot of people doing, doing that. <laughs> yeah. right. A few days later, yeah, yeah. I saw, I was at Dick's Sporting Goods and saw a Callaway golf driver that was like the first golf club powered by AI. And like, holy crap, he wasn't kidding. Like, it's literally everywhere. But now as it's more mainstream and probably more widely adopted, like the last 18 months, let's say, where do you see it adopting further from where it's at now? Welcome to ClickFunnels Radio, the podcast that brings you the latest strategies, insights, and success stories from online marketers just like you who utilize funnels to grow their business. Our mission is simple, to help you unleash the true potential of your online business by harnessing the power of funnels. Join us every week as we bring you exclusive interviews and thought-provoking discussions that will revolutionize the way you approach online marketing. Here are your hosts, Chris Cameron and Ben Harris. All right, everybody, welcome back to another awesome episode of ClickFunnels Radio. It is Ben here, and we, Chris, we haven't done an episode in a week or so. Anyway, I'm they excited to be that. here. It's yeah, great this to is see all you. fluid for them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> From our listeners, we've got someone here that is an eight-figure award winner and is really carving out a huge section of the AI market that I can't wait to get into and even hear about the future as well. So if you're beginning this your first time listening, make sure you stay to the end. We've got some fun surprises for you, but I'm super pumped today to welcome Iggy Odigizua to the Nailed show. It. Iggy, yes, I got it. Nailed it, Dan. I'm Every so syllable impressed. too. For those of you listening, before we just hit record, I was very self-conscious. I was going to mispronounce it incorrectly, but I did it right. And Iggy, thank you for your time. We're pumped to have you. How are you today, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Enjoying life. Yeah, right. Hey, That's awesome. I I got a question before we kick anything off, okay? I was looking at your bio, looking at some of this stuff, and you lived 8 years in Africa. Yep. Tell me about this. Like you said it was a small village. Like what's the story there? Yeah, so my family is uh from Nigeria and okay. uh my tribe is from a part of Nigeria called Benin. And so I was there as a kid when I was five years old. Like my family's one of like the founding families out there or something like that. I don't know what it is, but it's equivalent to like being some type of royalty. Um, and they have this tradition where like you send your firstborn kids or your sons to live with the chief of the tribe oh. for <laughs> a few years. <clears throat> so when me and my older brother were of age, my dad sent me and my older brother to go live in Nigeria in the village with our grandparents. And it was a very traumatizing experience. So it's just <laughs> really, so you were there from like five to 13. No, I was there for the first time I went there, I was there for five years. Right. So wow. I came back uh, when I was close to like eight or nine or something like that. And then the second time I went there was my choice as an adult. Uh, and I was That's there. Awesome for another three and a half years and didn't come back until 2017. Like 2018 is really when I came back. So it was, it was fairly recent. Wow. Okay, so I do have what one question you, though. Yeah. Go ahead. I'd say, what made you want to go, you know, you decided to go back. You said this time, either for the second time on your own accord, what went into that? Why'd you want to go? Honestly, there's a funny story behind it. Uh, I got injured as a, I had a football scholarship. I got injured and then ended up getting a full ride academic scholarship to a Christian college, right? So I was there at the Christian college studying and the people who were like running it, they felt like God put on their heart to start a, send a mission team to South Africa, Right. And so they hosted this like workshop with like it was like an international workshop where the different people from all over the world fly in. And so I ended up like attending this workshop. I had no idea what was going on. So I was trying to go meet with a friend and ended up in a conference room where they were talking about going to South Africa. And it was like 250 people in that room. And they're like, all right, let's go around and have everybody share why they want to go to South Africa and why they feel like God is putting on their heart to go. 
And it gets to me, I was like one of the last people. And I stand up and I'm like, I honestly have no idea what I'm doing here. <laughs> like I'm here by mistake. All these other people had like compelling reasons to be in the room. <laughs> and I'm like, I wandered in here. I was looking for something else. Like I have no idea why I'm in here. <laughs> and so they end up uh, deciding for whatever reason that felt like God put it on their heart to change it from South Africa to Nigeria. No, right. Sure. And so they had asked me like, hey, we know you have deep roots in Nigeria. Would you be willing to go? And so the host a separate meeting and it goes from like 250 people in the room to like 15 people show up <laughs> for that meeting to go to Nigeria. And I'm like, well, I guess I have to go now because nobody else showed up for this meeting. All these people who have these like emotionally charged are like, oh, I feel like God has put me on my heart to, to go to Africa. As soon as it goes from South Africa to Nigeria, it's like a ghost town. <laughs> they bounced. Yeah. So oh that's how I ended up going is like, there's really no other options. And I was like, man, like already, you know, I don't believe in coincidences. So I was like, I was sure. probably in the room for a reason. And then all of a sudden the change from South Africa to Nigeria. I was like, man, like if that's not a sign, I don't know what it is. So I was like, I have to go. And it was the most terrifying decision uh, I ever made. I was so scared. And, uh, but it was honestly the best thing that's ever happened to me. So in retrospect, going and, you know, you say that you don't believe in coincidence and so on. What do you think the reason was and maybe a lesson that you learned from being over there versus here? I mean, it was good for me to go back as an adult because I really got to be connected to my roots, right? Um, and being able to see like where my family came from, being able to meet with my cousins. I mean, I have a ton of family there. So my father has 24 siblings. My mom Holy has cow. 17 siblings, right? And they were all born in Nigeria. And so I have a ton of cousins, a ton of like, you can just, a lot of family, right? So getting to meet and just interact with the people there, I was like, wow, I start to understand myself on a, on a level that I never understood before, just like certain tendencies and how I view the world. I was like, wow, like it really, some of these things were passed down genetically uh, and it just made sense. I was like, wow, like I, I, I get myself. And then the other side that came off of it was I just realized how much opportunity we have here in the United States and how much of those opportunities I was squandering because I didn't know any better. Right. And a lot of people, that's why, like, when people come here from other countries, they make something of themselves simply because they're just so grateful and they come and look at the United States with a fresh set of eyes and just see opportunity everywhere. All right. And that's really what led to me coming back and starting my business. Um, and a part of my mission as far as starting a business is being able to, you know, employ people in third world countries and give them opportunities to actually better their lives. Because I saw the, some of the most amazing and talented people I've ever met in my life. And, you know, they weren't able to do anything simply because they just don't have those opportunities available to them. Wow. Yeah. That's an interesting lens. Awesome. I mean, yeah. I think there's got to be something to that. I mean, here you sit now, a few short years later after coming back from that, and if you guys are listening and not seeing this on YouTube or anything, you know, over over Iggy's shoulder or behind him is a Two Comic Club X Award. Let me explain what that represents for those of you who don't know. That means he's generated over $10 million, eight figures, using funnels, like generated revenue. Talk to us about that journey. Like, all right, you're back now. You're in the States. You're diving into your business. How did you get like the two comic club award, the two comic club X? What was that journey? Yeah. So I started in fitness. So when I came back to the States, I kind of came back under pretty traumatic uh, uh, circumstances, you know? So I came to visit my brother. He was, he got drafted to the giants and um, was going through a really hard time. And I was like, I just felt I had to come back and stay because I wasn't planning on coming back. I was planning on being in Nigeria for the rest of my life. Right. Mm -hmm. So coming back and seeing my brother in this situation that he was in, I was like, I have to stay and help him get out of it. So I ended up coming back and then I was like, well, I'm here. I need to start. I need to start working for myself and start doing something to be able to support myself, but then also be able to support some of the people that I met um, back in Nigeria. So I started a, as a personal trainer, right? I was already certified. I was doing some personal training work, working with athletes before I went to Nigeria. 
So I picked that back up and I was struggling. And then I found a guy in New Jersey who was making like $350,000 a year as an in-person trainer. I did not believe him. So I reached out to him and, and got lunch with him. Gotta ask, man, where in New Jersey? It was in Norwood, Norwood, New Jersey. Let's see. That's a little bit farther north, isn't it? Yeah. It's like Northern Jersey. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. The reason I say that is like Russell Brunson and I did a church mission together in Southern New Jersey. We were roommates for like six weeks out of two years that we spent there. That was my first connection to him. Anyways, keep going. Wow. Anytime That's somebody awesome. says New Jersey, I'm like, what? Wait, you got to tell me more. Yeah. So I met him and he showed me his book of business. And I was like, man, it was kind of like that. It was before I saw the Wolf of Wall Street, but I was like, dude, like I'm going to come work for you. Like I need to. So I literally packed up my bag. I met him Sunday, uh, Wednesday afternoon for lunch. I moved into his garage Thursday and started working from it for him there. Where I was like, I just need to watch how you're doing what you're doing. You don't even need to pay me. Like, I just want to observe how you're, how the hell are you doing this? So I started working for him and he, the way he's ran his operation was like a work of art. I don't even think he really understood what he was doing. Um, but I think very, I'm very systematic and I identify patterns. So I just saw like everything that he did and documented the entire thing. And then within third, within uh, three months, I started doing a hundred sessions per week just from implementing the things that I saw. And I started making more money as a in-person trainer than I did my entire five years combined, you know, um, simply because being around the, a guy who was doing the thing and being able to watch firsthand and implement it, I just got um, just through osmosis, you know, my, my standard went up. And everything just started to to click, but I was working like a dog. You yeah, know? I was gonna say a hundred sessions a week, like that had to cause burnout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a uh, it was rough. Um, but my comparison was I was in a village wiping my butt with leaves, eating once a day, and and walking right. miles, you know, and getting malaria and almost dying several times. So I was like, well, I'll take this hard over that hard any day of the yeah. week. <laughs> so I just couldn't complain about it. It was hard, but I'm like, I'll take this hard over that hard any day of the week. And they would take this hard over their current hard any day of the week. They would pay me to switch places. So I'm like, I can't complain about it. So I just, I just toughed it out. And then I saw an um an ad from a, a woman and she was like, I make $35,000 a month for my online fitness business, and I don't even know anything about fitness. I, when I tell you that ad, like it pissed me off, but then also shattered so many beliefs. It's a about, great hook. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, like I was like, my mind was just completely blown. I had no idea. I was like, how is that even possible? She's making damn near as much money as I am. And one, she doesn't know anything about it. And she filmed this ad from a beach. So she's not working as hard as I am. And I'm like, I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so Damn. i went down the rabbit hole and found the i found her mentor the person who helped her start online and i was like dude i'm like how much is it to get in your program he's like you have to attend a live uh workshop that i'm hosting in new, in new york i was like done i'm there like if you're gonna pitch something just pitch it to me like tell me like what do you what do i need to pay you to to put me on the game like to teach me the game like how she did it and so i ended up paying this guy he was my first paid mentor. Um, and that's where I started online. And then I discovered different tools and softwares that would allow me to translate what I learned operating in person business to the online space. And that's when I set up my first ClickFunnels account. And then from there, it was just a journey of going from one mentor to, a, to another until it clicked. Right. And when it clicked, it clicked pretty quickly. Can we hit on that for a minute? Cause I know, um, even in our community as well, everybody, sometimes they, they just become, how do I even say this? I was like addicted to learning. I'm probably gonna be wrong with saying that, but I'll explain what I mean is that they're always yeah, like, know you know, I'm not ready yet because I need to go read this book. I got to go get this course. And then they mm -hmm. end up with 19 different programs. They haven't gone through any of it, but they're like, ah, that next one is what I want to get at. What you did was you modeled success by the act of seeking mentorship. Right. Yep. And 
Sometimes you can read a book as much as you want, but it's not going to teach you the experiences that you need. And if, you know, uh, Russell always says model success, right? The fastest way to get to where you want is right to adopt that identity and to step into that light. You literally did because you lived in the guy's garage. Can you hit 100%. on the impact of what mentorship has done? And not to say mentorship versus education or anything like that, but how it's impacted you versus some traditional routes you might see people tell you to do. Yeah, I mean, one of the things is um, amateurs learn. Amateurs seek to understand before the act. Masters act into 100%. Understanding, right? That's cool. So for me, as an, I come from an athletic background. So I've always like sought, if I want to learn how to do something well, you need coaching, right? You just don't pick up a football and figure out how to be the best without guidance, right? So for me, I was like, I know I need to, if I'm going to practice something, I need to make sure I'm, I'm practicing the right things. Right. So that's why I sought mentorship is like, I want to, I want to see how you do it so I can practice what you're doing and actually implement it. But no, if I'm going to do something, I need to be working on the right things. Otherwise it's a waste of time and effort. All right. So for me, the mentorship was just honestly, just was just like the next logical step. I'm like, I need to find somebody who's doing a thing and because I already that behavior has already been reinforced several times, right? I packed up my bag, got started observing this guy as an in-person trainer and made more money as an in-person trainer than I even thought was possible, right? And that was because I learned from somebody who was where I wanted to be. So he never did anything online. And when I saw this woman bragging about what she was doing online, I was like, well... <laughs> <laughs> they know something I don't know. You know, she's not smarter than I am and she's damn sure not working harder than I am. So <laughs> she has information that I don't know. So I just need to figure out how to, how to pay that Delta down. Right. So I found a mentor and I was like, all right, show me exactly what I need to do. Right. I don't need to understand how, how it works. Just tell me what to do and I'm going to do it aggressively. And then I'm going to figure out the nuance as I'm doing the thing, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and so I experienced a little bit of success going through some of his stuff just wasn't a good fit, mainly because there were some things that he wanted us to do that I just didn't vibe with ethically. So that's really the decision I made to part ways and, and look for someone whose values are a little bit more in line with how I want to build the business. And then from there, just going from like one mentor, learning different parts, uh, of the business, implementing it, getting to a new level. And then finding somebody who's at that level who've already solved that problem. That's awesome. Yeah. So what, after you parted ways, was there, did you stay in the personal training space? What, uh, or stay in the online space, right? Did you get exposed to the internet? Like walk us through that. I'm curious. Yeah. So I ended up staying in the online space, but the way I built my online business initially was kind of like, I was like, if I met somebody and they saw me, they always were willing to pay for me to teach them how to get in shape. For the listeners, and you don't know, Iggy is jacked. So keep going. <laughs> you know, I try to take care of myself. So, <laughs> so I'm a walking billboard of the fact that I know what I'm doing, mm -hmm. you know? So I started getting my first online clients by just meeting people in person. I was like, you know what? We're all these entrepreneurs hanging out because those are the types of people that I want to work with, entrepreneurs and people who are like mission-driven so I started going to these little networking groups and then started acquiring my first online clients, just hustling uh, in person. And then eventually I was like, I need to figure out how to acquire clients online. I've learned how to build the infrastructure to be able to deliver my service online, but I don't know how to really get customers online, right? And that's where I uh, found a mentor who specifically taught uh, fitness professionals how to like generate online clients and he's the one that showed me how to set up a funnel, right? And so I was like, okay, I see this. I need to have a way to communicate what I do to people online like I would in person, right? I'm a billboard of what I do. So I need a virtual billboard or whatever it is, a process to kind of walk them through uh, my philosophy and introduce them to who I am. And then the sale becomes like the next logical step once they understand that I can solve their problem. All right. So started doing that online and then uh, started acquiring my organic clients. And then from there, I was like, well, organic is pretty inefficient. How do I do it with paid ads? Like I need I need more leverage. Right. Because I started running into the same issues that I was running into 
in person. It was just inefficient. Hustling all day, posting content and trying to figure it out. And then I found a mentor who taught specifically how to run paid at, pay traffic. All right. Mm-hmm. And so I was going through like those different levels and just learning different aspects of the business world that I didn't that I didn't know and filling in the skill gap. You know, I just lacked a lot of skill at the time. Chris, do you have a question? Because I want to drill down on something. No, go ahead. Do that. I had one more, Is, but, I, but I'm going to wait on it. It's uh, Iggy, you've referenced, and I mean, I've already asked you, but I want to drill on it again. You know, mentors. At this point, you're at half a dozen, right? You're not buying courses. You're seeking out, you know, individuals who you're looking to emulate, right? And adopt their identity. Did you have a strategy? How did you continue to meet people who you wanted to be? Were you hanging out in the right areas? You know, give us a framework for those listening. I mean, I was actively seeking it out. One of the things that you learn, um, because I didn't grow up religious, you know, I I became a Christian and found my faith later on. But one of the things that you learn is like, if you want something, you got to seek it, right? So I was very intentional about what I was looking for in a mentor, right? I wanted somebody who was doing the thing that I was doing and doing it better than I was doing, who was at a level that I wanted to be at, right? So those are kind of the lens. And one of the core philosophies that I really hold dear is uh, knowledge and proximity, right? Anything can really be had by being around the right people and getting the right information at the right time, right? So all the good that's happened to me up until this point can all drill down to knowledge and proximity, being around the right people and getting the right information at the right time that I can implement, so for me, that's what I was seeking. I was like, how can I get around people who were doing the thing that I wanted to do and who were at a level that I wanted to be at and have the skill that I was that I was lacking, right? And those are the lens that I would use to like study and, and figure out who the right mentor is going to be. And if it didn't work, I just like, well, maybe it just wasn't a good fit for me, but there's still something that's lacking or maybe I wasn't able to extract the information that I needed to kind of figure it out. So I got to find someone that can actually help me implement it the right way to get the results that I need. All right. I love hearing all this background too, because I know, you, right? see, you see people, right? They go through all this background and then they end up at a certain point. Like we're all on this call today because every decision we've ever made has led us to we're here. We're, here we are. Right. So you're currently working like with AI and if you need to backtrack to Ben, go ahead, but tell us how you kind of got to that point and how it really helps people generate clients um, without spending. Cause I think, I think the key here is a lot of people are spending a lot of time in exchange for the money. Like you were doing a hundred sessions a week and then you yep. figured out, I can't do that. That's not sustainable. And when people are going out and prospecting or they're trying to get clients, how does this shift help them get clients? without just, you know, being in front of the computer all day. Yeah. I mean, this came out of a, a problem that we were that we were running into. So I go from having my own online fitness business. I joined several different mentors and then figured it out. Right. I figured it out inside of a inside of another mentors program. I just built my own system using all the principles that I learned from all these different mentors. And it worked. And then it worked so well. He was like, let me just can I pay you? to license your system to all my clients, <laughs> right? Yep. So you start yeah. With, <laughs> yeah. So I got taken advantage of. I'm going to be completely honest. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you end up, I end up giving him my system and he teaches all his clients and it was just printing out like all of them were getting great results. Uh, same results that I was getting. But the difference is I had built out my backend infrastructure and automated my fulfillment to where I could just focus on acquiring new clients. So I was able to scale my team pretty quickly and got to a point where we had like 35 appointment setters at one point. And it was an administrative nightmare. Like it was just, it was terrible, right? Um, And then I had a lot of people reaching out to figure out how did you build this thing yourself? And then I started like a mentorship program, teaching people my systems and essentially giving them all our playbooks and things that I built. And the pattern that I noticed with, all the different businesses that I worked with and even within my own business was the gap between getting from like six to seven to even eight figures was just like, how well can you communicate your message? How well can you turn somebody who's interested into an engaged lead and turn that engaged lead into an actual client? That's really what it boiled down to. And 
when I was managing this massive team and trying to figure out how can we streamline this process, I started looking into technology and started to survey our clients and figure out like the clients that were the most successful going through my program. Because within like six months, we had produced like over 27 figure online fitness businesses. And so going through those guys that all of them had the same thing in common. They were hard workers, but they knew how to train people and they knew how to manage like their team to do a, to do all the appointment setting and turn those leads into engage leads and turn those engaged leads into buyers. Now understand right. this too, everybody listening. He didn't say 27 businesses. He said 27 figure businesses. That makes sense. So you're talking, you know, yeah. huge businesses, right? Um, that he's talking about, not just 27 online businesses. You're talking about 27. Yeah. You know, we, I mean, there were some unintended videos. consequences that came with that. We were still running our online fitness business at the time and just <laughs> created all this competition for <laughs> our own oh. business. And it was, uh, it was hilarious. Um, and some of those clients are still really good friends of mine to this day, but essentially our online business is growing so much faster than our mentorship uh, business. And we ended up making the decision kind of, phase out the mentorship and just focus on scaling uh, the online business. But um, in trying to figure out that problem, I identified like getting lead management was a real issue for us. And it was very inefficient having a ton of people do it. And I discovered you can use AI to do some advanced automations back in 2021, right? And we had built out the most complex and most robust AI automation sequence you've ever seen in your life. And it broke all the time, but it gave me the courage. I was like, when we did that and implemented it, we're able to scale back our team from 40 to like 25, right? Although it was inefficient, but it made our team more efficient and reduced the amount of people that we needed, right? And that's where, that's what paved the way for building AI setters and creating Charlie AI. And eventually, you know, once we solved that problem, we only needed three setters and we didn't reduce our revenue at all like we continue to scale that business Jeez. and then it grew organically love it love it did you have another That's question awesome. too ben um it's going to come to me but because uh, i'm just fascinated by the idea of mentorship but I'll, I'll, yeah, yeah. It'll, it's going to come back to me but i know kind of i don't want to jump far you know too far back and it, i guess you know kind of around ai where <sighs> Where's the puck headed? And that's very vague and open ended, but it's a world that, you know, it's a buzzword, right? Yeah. We had a guy, I don't know, like a year and a half ago, we were consulting with this is not for ClickFunnels, a different company. And we were talking about, you know, different hooks or whatever. And he just sat back his chair. He's like, dude, just put AI on it and it'll sell. Like, it's just whatever. <laughs> and I can a lot of people two, doing that. Yeah. <laughs> right. A few days yeah, later, yeah. I saw, I was at Dick Sporting Goods and saw a Callaway golf driver that was like the first golf club powered by AI. And like, holy crap, he wasn't kidding. Like, it's literally everywhere. But now as it's more mainstream and probably more widely adopted, like the last 18 mm -hmm. months, let's say, where do you see it adopting further from where it's at now in the next two years? Yeah, I mean, AI isn't going to replace people, but it it will Thank replace God. people. It won't replace it will replace people that don't know how to use it, right? So a human that knows how to utilize AI or a business that knows how to utilize AI will absolutely steamroll the business that doesn't know how to utilize it. Like it's just going to happen. The level of efficiency that you have. And how quickly you can go from idea to revenue with little to no person on your team is astonishing, right? Because you can essentially have an AI do all the most repetitive and tedious tasks within the business early on and get to a point where your revenue and your profit margins <clears throat> are really good to where you can hire like really talented staff. Right. And so you're able to create a better work environment for your team. You have less people and their their output utilizing AI is that of like two to three people. Right. So um, as people get better at utilizing it, they're going to be it's going to require like you to have like real skills that you can offer a company. Otherwise, you are gonna have a hard time finding employment. All right. So yeah, I see it disrupting a lot of a lot of industries. I mean, we're already doing that when it comes to like building sales teams, right? Um, and that's just going to continue as that as it advances and get better and better. 
Yeah, so, you know, teaming up with the machines, right? This isn't Terminator. You got to team up with them and figure out exactly how to do this the right way. And I think this is good for the listeners to hear. Like, instead of saying, okay, well, I got to do my job a lot better or whatever so I don't get replaced, we'll team up and figure out how to improve your productivity based on using the tools that are available rather than, you know, fighting against it or trying to beat it. You know, you're not Paul Bunyan. Yeah, use it to, I mean, here are the areas that we we utilize AI now, right? We use it in a lot of our content creation. I've not had to personally write an email in almost a year. Yeah. And our emails, I just look, I was literally looking at it with our content team this morning. We average about 35% open rate. Um, That's great. For like the, all of 2024. And I didn't have to write a single email. I trained an AI model to write an email the way that I would, to communicate the way that I would. I taught it my values, my tone, my personality, all the little nuances. And now my team uses that to write emails and send those out to our list. They use it to create content, to create video scripts. And then I have another model that I use to clone my voice. So they don't even need me. They just, they're like, all right, we need this content. Let's have uh, Iggy's AI create the, the video script. Let's give it to his AI voice clone, do a voiceover, and then they record all the videos and just dis- distribute it out uh, across all our channels. Nuts. That's nuts. So did you make just a custom GPT? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. So the custom GPT we use internally for our content creation, for even for building scripts, for building sales letters and things like that. And then our platform, Charlie AI, is one that we actually have to build from scratch to do the work of an SDR, um, mainly because we're trying to duct tape using a GPT and Zapier and things like that. And this wasn't functioning the way that we need it. So we ended up building Charlie from scratch. And now it's our lead management system, right? All of our offers go through it. So if we have generating leads, we give it to Charlie. Charlie will follow up with the leads, have a conversation with them, decide who on our team they should book in with, depending on how quality, how qualified they are for the offer. If they're not our ICP, downsell them into something else. So now it does all of that for us on complete autopilot. So I can focus on just putting the right people in different parts of the business that are the most qualified. Yeah, everybody needs something like this. They they really do. And like understanding how to leverage this. But a lot of times people don't know where to start. And that's what I love about kind of what you're doing. So if people wanted to find out more, get involved with you, like where do they go to check this out, get involved and get a little bit of help to, to jumpstart this? Yeah, if they want to find out about Charlie, they go to charlieai.io. And that's where they can ultimately, if they're generating leads and have a business where they require a sales conversation to be had before somebody uh, purchases their product or service, charlieai.io is going to be uh, where they want to go. If they're just somebody who just needs, wants direction on how to implement different types of AI tools throughout their entire business, they just they could just follow me on either on socials, Iggy Odiggy's away either on Instagram or, or Facebook. I try to give all that away for free. Well, and, and yeah, you'll have to, you'll have to probably copy and paste like from this, because you're never going to be able to spell that just by having Iggy say that. So yeah, copy and paste. <laughs> you try. Yeah. yeah. I have exactly. one last question as we're wrapping here, Iggy. Um, I guess even a brief insight, even so some tools that we're using leveraging AI, one, you know, departments that we work in are involves our affiliate programs. And a lot of that sometimes involves like bringing on new people, right? Who's up and coming in the industry, who's building an audience that might not necessarily have their own product or, you know, are there pieces of blank real estate and things that they offer where ClickFunnels could supplement and enhance what they're doing? Mm -hmm. Uh, There's certain research tools, which, you know, by keywords goes out and look at who's, who's publishing content, TikTok, YouTube, using right, you know, within their descriptions, hashtag, what have you. So like, we've been doing a lot of that to sort of, it doesn't fully automate lead generation per se, but it's an extra pair of eyes out there, yeah. right? So we can focus on biz dev initiatives and things like that. When someone's brand new to AI, like let's pretend my grandma's listening to this and she's trying to start a business. Love you, grandma. But what uh, like, what are some things that they could be doing, some tools they could start researching uh, on their own to start to leverage and leverage themselves better? Honestly, they can start with like chat GPT, right? Okay. Even if they started free, with like a yeah. free account. One of the things that you could do 
is use AI to tell you how to use AI. <laughs> right. And I actually so, never did anyone say that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I will, if I'm trying to figure out, I'm like, all right, uh, GPT, I'm struggling gathering all this data for my team. And I'm trying to figure out the best way to automate this. Are there any AI applications that you know of that I can that I can use to, to solve this problem? And they'll give me different tools. And I'm like, okay, great. What's the best way for me to actually utilize these tools? All right. And I'll go in and ask it questions to get the information that I need. And then I'll take that entire process, give it to my assistant, be like, all right, cool. I essentially got all the instructions that you need to implement this recommendation from my AI assistant go actually do it, <laughs> right? And it'll give you details step-by-steps on what you can do. Um, and so as I use the tools to help me figure out how to use the tools that I need based on the problems that I'm that I'm trying to solve for within the business, right? Start with ChatGPT, figure out what you're trying to solve for, and then ask it to give you recommendations on how to solve it, and then ask it to give you tools that you can utilize to solve it Right. And then ask it for instructions on how to use those tools <laughs> to solve the thing. Right. And so now I have like my own AI system that I've pretty much fully trained on every part of my business. So I can just go in and start a conversation with it and it can do the research. It can essentially build out like different SOPs and things like that. But they're powerful. And it just starts with being curious and asking good questions. That's really all it boils down to. It's phenomenal. I definitely, from this conversation I've taken away, you are a phenomenal top tier at asking questions. You've picked the right mentors. You've asked the right questions. You've known who's leading you the right way. You've adopted to artificial intelligence. And now you're asking what the robots, that's the wrong term, but you're asking that the right to, I mean, you're a phenomenal no, robot. questions. It's robots. Yeah. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. And I love them. I'm like, I love uh, technology. I'm a, I'm a massive nerd when it comes to tech. Um, and one of the things that you can do is just anyone who has like IP and any kind of like information, you can just something that we do for our clients now is like we'll help them take their IP and train like an, an AI assistant to be able to help them leverage those IPs. But you can take your IP and then have a model that's kind of stores all those different things. And then you can ask it specific questions and have it build out assets based on the information that it has about your business and what it knows about it. So smart. So smart. Right. Well, Iggy, you're awesome, man. Give us that URL one more time before we let you go. Yeah, you can go to charlieai.io uh, to get all the details that you need about kind of like what we do and how to go about doing it. And hopefully uh, some of you guys get to be users of the platform. Love it. Thanks, man. You're awesome. Thank, Thank you. you.